Well, good morning, OCC family, and welcome everyone who's joining us online this morning. Uh, Today, we're going to continue our series, Room for Doubt, and we're going to do so by looking at part two of a message that we began last Sunday. This message is called, Why Does God Allow Tragedy and Suffering? If you'll remember from last week's message, I mentioned that a national survey was taken asking individuals, what's the one question that you would ask God if you could? And by far, the overwhelming response, the number one response was this. People wanted to know, why is there suffering in the world? You know, one thing that we all have in common this morning is this. Uh, We've all experienced the storms of life. We've all experienced the the challenges, struggles, and problems that, that come and go. And if you haven't, you will at some point. You know, when we go through times like this, I think it's only natural for us to ask the question, why? And maybe for you this morning, your why is this. Lord, why aren't my kids following Jesus. Or maybe for you, it's why is my marriage falling apart? You know, why did someone I love have to pass away? Or maybe I think what's on a lot of people's minds today, why is something like the coronavirus spreading in the way that it's spreading? Well, I'd remind you of the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. This is what we read. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see, thing, uh, see everything with perfect clarity. All that we know now is partial and incomplete. But then we will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. See, it's not wrong to doubt. And it's certainly not wrong to ask questions. In fact, throughout this series, I've said that God can, can get a hold of the doubt that we have. He can use the questions that we have to grow a greater faith in us. But it's also important to understand that we may not have all the answers to all the questions that we're going to have in this life, especially when we want to know the why behind having to go through a specific challenge or a specific life storm. Last week, I challenged us to begin to to think about taking a step back. And instead of asking why a specific tragedy or why a specific life storm had to happen, or maybe why someone else that we know is having to go through a specific season, a difficult season, it would actually be more beneficial for you as an individual, for your family, and for our church to ask the more general question, to focus on the more general question of why does God allow tragedy and suffering? You know, when we ask this question and then we decide to go to God's word for the answers, we discover some some really important truths. Remember the analogy from last week that comes from author Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. So Lee and his wife, they were driving up a Wisconsin highway in the dark when suddenly they encountered heavy rain and dense fog. They could barely see where they were headed. They could no longer see the white stripe on the side of the road. But they couldn't stop. They couldn't slow down even because of fear that someone would come up behind them and then end up rear-ending their vehicle. So this is a tense situation. Maybe you've been through something like this. But then a a truck appeared in front of them, and they could see his taillights clearly through the mist. And the truck apparently had fog lights because it was traveling at a consistent speed. So they made the decision that they were just going to follow this truck. If they did that, if they followed the light, They knew that they'd be headed in the right direction. You know, I think the same is true for us in understanding why there's tragedy and suffering in our own lives and in the world. See, we might not be able to understand all of the details for why we have to go through a specific uh, difficult season or a specific life storm. But there are some important key biblical truths, some points of light that we're going to call them that can illuminate things for us along the way. And church, if we'll follow these truths, if we'll follow these points of light, they're going to lead us in the right direction uh, towards answers that can help us navigate the road of life. I would also say this, that today, if we would take the time to reflect on these truths and apply God's, God's word and his truths to our lives, especially before the storms of life happen, 
we're going to be better equipped and better able to trust God during these difficult seasons. So the first two points of light from last week's message, we'll have just a short recap this morning. Number one, God is not the creator of evil. And number two, though suffering is not good, I think we would all agree with that, God can use it to accomplish good. So let's look at this first one real quick, this first truth. God is not the creator of evil. This is so important for us to understand, especially when addressing the question, why does God allow tragedy and suffering? Remember, when God created human beings in his own image, he wanted us to experience real love, real love for him and real love for others. But to give us the ability to love, God also had to give us the freedom to choose not to love. And that's because genuine love always involves free choice. Let me say that again. Genuine love, real love, always involves free choice. So unfortunately, as human beings, we've abused our free will, and we've done this in a number of ways, but first and foremost, by rejecting God and by walking away from God. We've all done this in some capacity in our lifetime. And this rejection or rebellion towards God, it actually started in the garden, and it's what introduced sin and evil into the world. In fact, the Bible tells us that since the time of the fall, in Genesis chapter 3, every person that's ever been born, every single person, with the exception of Jesus, has sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, this is what we read. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Did you hear that, church? You see, we are sinners by nature and by choice. Uh, From the time of birth, we've inherited this sin nature, and then throughout our lifetime, we sin, and that sin is always a choice. You know, when we look at the tragedy and suffering around the world, I don't think it takes very long to to be able to see that it's often our own irresponsibility and self-centeredness that hurts others. Take the coronavirus, for example, you know, something that we're experiencing here in our own community, in our state, our country, and and, and certainly around the world. But you see something like the coronavirus start to spread, and you see hundreds of people rushing to the grocery store, uh, trying to stock up on a three-month supply of toilet paper, or trying to fill their pantry with as much food as they can fit until it's overflowing. I mean, I've seen some crazy videos online of people pushing shopping carts to their car, just stacked, uh, you know, um, it feels like a mile high full of this stuff. You know, I believe that's one example of what we call moral evil. People acting out on their own sinful nature, thinking only of themselves and not thinking of other people around them, thinking about ways they can serve others for Christ. Church, the, the people of God should be different than this. We should live our lives differently. In fact, we should build our lives on the promises of God, and we should live according to his word. One of those promises is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27. And this is what we read. This is why I tell you to to not worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. I mean, isn't life more than food? And your body more than clothing? And then Jesus says this, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. You know, they don't stockpile three months of toilet paper. He says, for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? In fact, I love this last part. He says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? That's, That's a rhetorical question. Of course it won't. Church, this is a message that we all need to hear this morning. I heard uh, Pastor Craig Groeschel, he pastors LifeChurch.tv, he shared this with his congregation last week, and I thought it was timely to just pass on to you today. He said, you know, there's a lot of things that we carry that we pass on to others. The virus is certainly one of those things. He said, but worry is also one of those things. Worry is contagious, but so is hope. See, when our hope is in this world and in things and in people, these things are always going to let us down. The world will let us down. People will let us down. And that worry that we experience is going to end up spreading like wildfire to everyone around us. But when our hope is in Jesus, 
and we choose to stand firm on his word and to build our lives on the promises of God, that hope that we have will also spread to others. See, during this time, specifically in this season, it's important to ask ourselves, what are we spreading? Are you spreading worry and fear, or are you spreading hope to others? Well, the second point of light from last week, the second truth, I think is such an encouraging truth, and that is that though suffering is not good, again, we, we would all agree with this, God can use it to accomplish good. And what an encouraging truth. You see, God doesn't cause evil and suffering, but he does promise to cause good to emerge for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We know that God can use our suffering in a number of ways. He uses it to help us uh, draw closer to him. He uses our suffering to help mold and shape our character. And he can even use our story, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of our story to help influence others for Jesus, to point others to Christ. And I truly believe that God never wastes a hurt. There's purpose in our pain. And God can use whatever it is that we're going through in this life for his glory and for the good of others. So this morning, let's talk about these last three truths, these last three points of light. Remember, these are biblical truths that can help us as we address the question, why does God allow tragedy and suffering? So the third point of light, the third truth is this, if you're taking notes, that a day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. If you're taking notes, you can write that down with me. A day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. And what an important truth to remember today. You know, it's common for people to say something like this, that if God had the power to eradicate evil and to eradicate suffering, then why doesn't he just go ahead and do it? Well, the scriptural answer to that question is this. Just because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean that he won't ever do it. Think of it this way. It's kind of like reading a book. So my wife is an avid reader. Um, I, I like to read and certainly sometimes have to force myself to read. Maybe you love to read or don't love to read, but I, I think you'll be able to understand this, this analogy. It's like reading a book. If you were to only read half of a really good book and then decide to just slam it shut because you felt like at, at that particular point, the author just wasn't doing a, a good job, that he was leaving open too many loose ends. He wasn't resolving the issues quickly enough. If you decided to slam the book shut at that point, I would point out to you that you only read half the book. See, the Bible reminds us that the story of this world isn't over yet. The story of your life isn't over yet. In fact, God's word tells us that the day will come when sickness and pain will be eradicated. And people will be held accountable for the evil that they've committed. Justice will be served but in a perfect way, in God's way. That day will come, but it's not here yet. So the question this morning is, what's holding God up? You know, why, why hasn't God chosen to completely eradicate evil and suffering from the world yet? Well, one answer is that some of you may be the reason. Maybe God is, is delaying because of his love for you. Here's what I mean by that. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, friends, when I read a verse like this and many others throughout God's word, I see compelling evidence for a loving God that he would care that much for you and for the people that you love to give you a little bit more time to put your faith in Jesus if you haven't already. Yet God's heart today is that you wouldn't wait. See, Christ may or may not return today, but the length of your life is always uncertain. And today you can respond to God's loving invitation. See, God's free gift of grace, his free gift of salvation and forgiveness, it's a promise for all people, and it's received by God's grace through faith in Jesus. See, a day is coming when suffering will cease, and God will judge evil. 
you're taking notes, the fourth point of light, the fourth truth is this, that our suffering will pale in comparison to what God has in store for those who love him. Our suffering will pale in comparison. It'll pale in comparison to what God has in store for those who love him. Again, what an awesome truth today. You know, I certainly don't want to minimize pain and suffering this morning, but it does help if we have a long-term perspective. We'll call this an eternal perspective on things. I want to share a verse with you this morning that was actually written by the Apostle Paul. Here's a man who was beaten and stoned for his faith. He was imprisoned on multiple occasions, rejected by many of the people in the towns that he went to to spread the gospel. Uh, On many occasions, he went without food and water. Here's a guy who experienced homelessness and more pain than most of us will ever experience in a lifetime. Let's look at Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. This is what he writes. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Paul went through some difficult life storms. I believe you've gone through some difficult times in your life as well. But we can learn from Paul's example. You see, he didn't allow the storms of life to diminish his faith. He understood that there was purpose in the pain. See, our present troubles can actually grow a greater faith in us by reminding us about how Christ suffered for us on the cross. They can cause us to look beyond this life and have an eternal perspective on things. They can actually allow others to see how you're choosing to live out your faith, especially in a difficult season, so that they can more clearly see Jesus in you. They also give God the opportunity to show off in a big way, to demonstrate his power and his grace for his people. See, Paul chose to view his troubles as opportunities. Let me say it in another way. Let's let's say on the first day, of 2020, the first day of the new year, you just had a terrible day. You you crashed your car and you didn't have insurance. Maybe your spouse got sick. You had a close friend who decided to disown you. They didn't want to speak to you anymore. And then you had to go to the dentist and you had to get a root canal. And as you're driving to the pharmacy, you learn they don't have the pain medication that you need. I mean, from start to finish, it was terrible. It's kind of like the, the title of that children's book, Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I think we actually just read this to our kids not too long ago. But then, every other day throughout the year turns out to be amazing. I mean, your relationship with God is thriving. You have a friend who inherits $100 million, and he decides he wants to give you a million. I mean, wouldn't that be something? You have your first child, and he or she is healthy and strong. You get promoted to your dream job, and then you find out they're going to send you on a six-month paid vacation to to the destination of your choice. So then the next year, on New Year's Day, 2021, your friend asks you, so how was your year? You know, if they asked you this question, I, I believe you would say it was great. It was amazing. It was the best year that you've ever had. And if they were to bring up that one bad day, I mean, sure, you'd be able to look back and say, hey, this is a difficult day. There's There was a lot of pain. I didn't really like getting a root canal and then not having pain medication. But when you look at the entire year, you put everything into context. You have a a long-term perspective. I think you would say, man, it it was a great year. You know, the 364 good days, they far outweigh the one bad day. By comparison, that one bad day just sort of fades away. It's kind of like it never happened. I think this is a good analogy for what believers will experience for all eternity with God. Again, I don't want to deny the reality of the pain that maybe you've experienced at some point in your life or or maybe that you're experiencing right now. But understand this, that in heaven, when we're in Christ in heaven, after 654,584,440 days of pure bliss, with infinitely more days of bliss yet to come, if someone were to ask you this question, so how has your existence been? I think you would instantly react. You wouldn't even have to think about it. You would just say, it's been amazing. 
Words won't even be able to describe what it'll be like to walk with God, just like he originally planned in Genesis chapter 1. You know, when we put things into context, choosing to have a long-term perspective, the, the bad days, they're not even worth comparing to what eternity with God is going to be like. See, God promises a time when there will be no more crying, no more tragedy, no more suffering. In fact, I would say this morning, let the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.9 really soak in today. 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared, and listen to this, for those who love him. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. See, our suffering will pale in comparison to what God has in store for those who love him. Do you know Jesus today? Do you love God? Do you know that you're loved by God? That's an important question, the most important question to ask. Well, friends, if you're taking notes, the fifth and final point of light, the final truth is this, that you can decide whether to turn bitter or to turn to God for peace and courage. You can decide whether to turn bitter or to turn to God for peace and courage. A little bit longer of a point there, but again, a truth that has so much for our lives today. You know, I think we've all seen examples of how the same suffering that causes one person to turn bitter, to turn away from God, to become hard and angry at the world, can cause another person to turn to God, where they experience his peace, they experience his, his courage and strength. You know, some who, who lose a loved one end up turning inward, where they spend all of their time hurting, all of their time angry, and in a never-ending cycle of despair, while others choose to turn to God, receiving his peace, his courage and strength, and allowing God to, to even use their lives to influence the lives of others who are also hurting. You know, we're all going to face tragedy and, and suffering at some point in this life, but we can also make the choice whether to run away from God or to turn to God during those difficult seasons. You know, I started last week's message with the words of Jesus in John 16, verse 33. And I want us to look at this verse again this morning. It says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But Jesus says, take heart because I have overcome the world. You know, the power of God through Jesus offers us the two things that we need most in difficult seasons, in times that we're hurting. It offers us peace to deal with our present, and it offers courage to face the future. You know, this peace and courage, they're only available because Jesus has overcome the world. Through his suffering and through his death, he's deprived this world of its power over you. See, suffering doesn't have to have the last word anymore. Death doesn't have the last word. Jesus is the last word. So let me finish the story of, of Lee and Leslie Strobel as they drove through that Wisconsin storm. So they, they were following the taillights of the truck uh, in, into the fog. When the fog slowly began to lift, the rain began to lift, and they entered a small town that was actually lit up with streetlights. See, things all of a sudden became clear. They could see a lot better. And as they followed the road into the town and around a corner, guess what they saw uh, silhouetted against the night sky? They saw the steeple of a church and the cross of Christ on top. See, after driving through the fog for so long, the image of the cross really reminded them about what is important, what really matters. They followed some, some points of light that led them to a cross, a cross that ironically symbolizes the victory of Jesus and also the victory of those who follow him. 
it was Christian philosopher Peter Kraft who explained this. I think this is so helpful for us today. He said, God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation. All right, it's not an essay. He says it's the incarnation. Let me say that again. God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation. It's the incarnation. See, suffering is a personal problem, and it demands a personal response. And our God is is not some distant, detached, and impersonal deity. He entered into our world and personally experienced our pain. And you know what? He did that for you. He did that for me. See, Jesus is there in the lowest places of our lives, as well as the mountaintops. Are, Are you broken this morning? You see, Jesus was broken for you. Do you feel rejected? Well, Jesus was rejected as well. Has someone betrayed you or turned against you? Well, Jesus was sold out, and then he was actually abandoned by some of his closest friends. You know, towards the beginning of last week's message, I shared some of the tragic events that have happened uh, more recently in our world. And while these events may still leave us somewhat confused, you know, when, when difficult things happen, when tragedy strikes, I think it definitely can leave us confused. One truth that they clearly illustrate is this. Friends, life is, is fragile. Life is short. These kinds of tragedies, they, they often happen suddenly. I mean, it's not fun to talk about, and I, and I get that. But, you know, people who face tragedy, they often had no clue that tragedy was about to, to strike. In this world, we often don't know when tragedy and suffering will come. We don't always get a warning when somebody has a heart attack. We don't get a warning when, when a drunk driver crosses the center line. We don't get a warning when, a, when an F5 tornado touches down in Oklahoma, where I'm from. Friends, today I'm compelled to ask everyone who's watching this morning, do you know Jesus? Do you sincerely and truly know him? I think one of the best verses that, that I can share this morning is from 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. It says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. He's saying you can know with certainty what eternity looks like for you. See, God doesn't want you wondering about your eternity. He doesn't want you consumed with doubt and anxiety over your status for eternity. God's word tells us that we can know for sure Do you rely on the fact that maybe you attend church every week or every other week or maybe you attend on Easter and Christmas? Do you rely on those things? Do you rely on the fact that maybe you're part of a small group or you have a group of of, of Christians, Christian friends? You know, God's word is clear that you can actually be religious but not be in a loving relationship with Jesus. In fact, I would say religious activities never saved anyone. See, salvation doesn't come by attending a great church, by joining a small group, by just taking communion, or by hanging out with a bunch of Christians. I mean, all of these things are good. We should do these things. We should be involved in these things. But God's word is clear that salvation comes by God's grace through faith in Jesus. That's how you experience God's peace and courage in your life. Today, if you have questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus, about what it means to follow Jesus, I wanna encourage you to do a couple things. If you have someone around you today that that you can talk to, that it's maybe a, a spiritual leader in your life, maybe a little more mature in their faith, Talk to them about these things, but also we're going to throw up on the bottom of the screen here uh, the email address to our church. That's uh, go to occ.church at gmail.com. And I want to encourage you to email us today. You know, if you've experienced tragedy in your life, if you're currently going through a difficult season and you need prayer, uh, the same is true for that. Just contact us. We'll have a pastor or an elder. Uh, get back with you as soon as possible. We would love to pray with you and for you. We'd love to talk with you about how you can take that first step in being a follower of Jesus. I believe that God can 
and will use the suffering that we experience in this life to draw us closer to himself. He, he's going to use these difficult seasons uh, to grow and strengthen our character. He's also going to use our lives to make a difference, to be difference makers, to be kingdom workers, to impact the lives of others who also have doubts, who also have questions. Today, let's turn to Jesus during this time and allow him to fill our lives with his peace, his courage, and his strength. Right now, uh, wherever you may be, if you're in your living room, if you're at work, if you're watching this week's service in your car, I wanna invite you to bow your head and we're gonna close with a time of prayer today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good. You are faithful. I, I think everybody watching today knows that if we were to try to just get through this life on our own, it's, it's impossible. We don't have the strength, especially when the storms of life come. We can't get through that on our own. Lord, not only do you want to help us get through those times, there's, there's also a lesson there to be learned. And today, Lord, I ask that for those who are struggling, for those who have doubts and have questions, that you would fill them with your peace. You would give them your courage and your strength. But Lord, that maybe today our prayer would not be, you know, take these things away. But it would be, Lord, show us the lesson in the storm and help our actions, our words, and our thoughts glorify you above all else. And today, I also pray for those who don't know you. Lord, that through hearing your word, they would believe. That they would believe that Jesus is who he says he is. We pray for them this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.